So thanks for coming to our session. My name is Mark Carbone and I'm uh, thrilled to uh, be presenting with uh, Andrew Boronsky. Uh, Andrew's a very uh, innovative and forward-thinking teacher um, in the Waterloo Region District School Board. He's been involved in a number of our uh, pilot projects and coaching teachers and so on. He's also the CEO of uh, TEDx Kitchener Ed, which has uh, been a great event um, for the last two and number three is in the works for uh, fall. 2017. Cool. And thanks for that introduction. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Mark Carbone. Uh, he's the CIO for the WRDSB. Um, and along with this is only a very small sampling of all things he's been the chair director for. He's the ECHO president, OSAPAC co chair of the OSAMU project meet, and the OAS co director, among a number of other things. So, uh, And uh, sadly, we're losing Mark at the WRDSB. He's retiring on the 31st this month. So um, a big loss for us. But anyway, Congratulations. Uh, Oh, thanks. <laughs> Make it out alive. <laughs> That'll be the first task. Tweet something on November the 1st. <laughs> Read it! <laughs> so our presentation today, first of all, just to let you know, we are both recording it and live streaming it. Um, we believe as um, educators we should model open learning and sharing, so um, everything's uh, uh, cooking here. Um, and please ask questions as we go along. I think we've got enough flex time built in that we don't have to hold off questions till the end. Our idea today is to show our journey not just from a technological point of view but also what's happened in the classroom, what this means for change of teacher practice and all of that is kind of a sort of whole picture approach uh, to doing this. Uh, so by way of starting, um, one of the things that we did in our school board about uh, five or six years ago was start in with some writing projects. They were the kind of projects where if you want to be involved, you applied as a school to participate. A school for us being one of 120 sites, 100 elementary schools, 16 secondary. And um, sort of technology was metered out uh, in participation with, with the project, not permanently assigned to the schools. Some of the things that we started to play with there, um, just moving writing from paper to online. Um, we looked at uh, some online collaboration. In those days, of course, it was sort of pre-Google Apps, uh, but nonetheless, uh, some good exploring and learning using a WordPress multi-user as a blogging platform, um, really uh, pushing teachers into some peer sharing and and so on. Um, those kinds of projects are, are still going on, but they were a good, good forerunner. One of the things that I believe in as we've taken this path is kind of a reculturing of our IT department where we need to put our learning out there too. Not everything's going to be perfect right out of the gate. And so we've been kind of pushing the limits on how fast we can get uh, quality work done and you know, iterate, keep making adjustments, fine tuning things. Um, so the next uh, big foray for us was something um, that we dubbed as the Futures Forum Project. Um, this was something that grew out of a uh, group from our senior team, which included me and uh, some superintendents uh, from our school board. It's around the idea of really submerging in those days, again, winding the clock back about five years ago into a program where we actually put ourselves out, started blogging, connecting on social media platforms, um, looking at how that impacted our practice as professionals, looking at what you could do with that in the classroom. Um, so our action research project uh, from our uh, participation in that year-long program actually was uh, sort of born as the, the Futures Forum uh, project. So we can probably get the yeah. next slide. So we designed this um, as a brand new program and it was around four, uh, four attributes. Uh, the intent here was to change up things as it traditionally happened in a secondary school environment. So we designed a program that revolved around one teacher. Um, it used uh, two time slots, so teacher had it rather than sort of traditional high school semester timetabling. You had the same group of students for a full half day. Um, initially, um, we started with a, a common set of courses, two credits, uh, blending together English, civics, and uh, the careers program. And then as kind of a guiding principle, we had this sort of motto of whatever happened in that course, whatever developed out of that framework, had to 
sort of be framed around this idea of the four enemies, anytime, anywhere, anyone, anything, and learning. And so that was kind of our mantra for pushing beyond the walls of the classroom. And so uh, I had the pleasure of starting with these Project Teachings projects about five or six years ago now in the second year of the program. Um, it was really interesting, it was fantastic. It was kind of like our senior main kind of came down. So we want you guys to play in the class, we want you to try different things, we want you to integrate technology. And so it was this interesting fusion of how bring technology in the classroom and how had a good pedagogy kind of mixed together in that kind of interesting dynamic. Um, it was the focus would be very collaborative tools. So we had one of these sections in each of uh, I think about, I got up to about ten or twelve of our sixteen high schools and I was looking to take an online space and kind of break down classroom walls and see what teacher collaboration looked like and that sharing back and forth and also student collaboration looked like in the digital space between schools and across that space. Um, it was a really interesting, we saw a lot of really great changes that kind of came out of the student learning and teacher practice as well. I um, mean, that was a big takeaway for a lot of us was when you give devices to students in the class, how does that only really change uh, the tech aspect of the classroom? How does it change teacher pedagogy? How does it change teacher practice? So initially, um, when we started this, we asked schools not to timetable our, our classes that were in this program into labs. We wanted to sort of push into mobile technology. So at that time, it was Windows netbooks and a few iPads for classroom. Uh, Chromebooks were kind of on the surface, just, just coming out. And of course, that's a core part of our, our mix at this point in time. Um, but again, it was this idea of using technology as a seamless part of the learning instead of when you're scheduled into a lab or sitting at a desktop for a particular time period. Yeah, as a pilot project, it was interesting in that evolution for us as well. So um, we had Lenovo netbooks, and six years ago, they were very happy as teachers to have them in our classrooms. It was about a one to two ratio um, for uh, device students. Uh, with a couple iPads, and we ran into a bunch of headaches. Uh, the Wi-Fi six years ago for us just would, would crash a lot, and that chain really was a headache for us in a lot of ways. Uh, the Lenovo notebooks were not the best devices. Uh, we kind of had a lot of frustrations with those as teachers. Uh, and it was interesting having that dynamic back and forth with our IT team and having them take our feedback, and that kind of involved us trying some Chromebooks in our classroom as well, and seeing a lot of improvements in the Wi-Fi throughout the board, and how that kind of changed our evolution as well, how that kind of played the classroom. One of the uh, models that we used in helping teachers think about using the technology is I think fairly widely known and widely understood now. Uh, but in those days, we were really looking at this idea of moving through substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition as a, thinking about it more as a growth mindset, as a way of evaluating what you're doing now, embedding a reflective practice into the classroom, and making sure that as an educator, you're always thinking about how to improve your practice. It's not, yay, I made it to the R level, I'm done. It's always about, you know, fine-tuning, reflecting, most importantly, using technology for the best way to enable learning in any particular setting. So, um, I, I know there's some controversy about the SAMR model in terms of, is it a model and how well has it been researched? I think over time it's played out there's less research than people originally thought, but I still think it's a valuable model um, for that personal reflection piece. Yeah, and for us at the ground level in the classroom, um, it was just a good conversation piece for us to look at kind of as we bring technology in our classrooms, um, how can that change our classroom? And it was an interesting conversation. Like I said, when you have a one to two ratio, we have 30 kids and 15 netbooks, what does that look like? What can you do in your classroom? Um, at that point, they were staying in the classroom as well, too, so the kids had them there for that hour and, or hour period, but what does that look like when they left? Did kids have access at home? Did kids not have access at home? Um, and how does that look at how to change teacher practice as well? So the actual program itself was sort of uh, developed um, over the summer and during the first semester. Our, our plan was to launch the first version of the Features Forum project in semester two. And we've had really these four core elements. So moving from writing on paper to writing online, I mentioned early on we, we did a lot with uh, WordPress multi-user blog. Now, of course, that's well entrenched uh, in our Google Apps environment. And I know Andrew's going to speak to some of the changes in practice that happened along uh, those lines. Uh, one of the other uh, part of this was um, a lot of inquiry-based learning. And so the idea of uh, researching sharing your learning that way, uh, creating new content, and we ended up with collaboration between schools where students had to actually produce an online publication. Um, 
we also had um, uh, cross-school novel study. So when we actually got to launch, um, we had one teacher in each of seven different high schools. And that was kind of the lay of the land for the first year. And one of the things that was really neat and was very popular with the students was this idea that um, a student in my class could actually sign up to study the novel that Andrew was teaching. And his students could sign up at another teacher. And so we had this whole way of, it was the beginning part of student voice, student choice, and in those days, uh, early on before Google Hangouts, we just used Adobe Connect as a video medium uh, to bring those classes together. And if you think back to where I talked about the two classes being scheduled in the morning, that was an agreed upon sort of timetabling standard, just from the point of view of making it easy for students and teachers to connect. We basically had that same morning focus uh, in order to bring that together. And the last part was uh, we had um, a commitment that the schools would in some way involve social media as part of their um, interactions uh, in the course. I think the, the most popular thing which lives on today was this idea of uh, what became known as TED Talk Fridays. And teachers would collectively um, choose a TED Talk, they would all show it, and then the students would interact around what they learned, what their questions were, their observations, uh, share their insights, all that interaction happened through Twitter accounts. So we had established school and board level um, hashtags, and it was a way of getting the students to interact online. The thing that we found was a hidden benefit of it was a lot of students that wouldn't talk in a form like this actually would participate. And we noticed that overall participation rates went up. Um, we also had some students say, you know what, I'm a reflective thinker. I might post a comment later instead of right now. And so it helped create this ongoing uh, dialogue. Yeah, it was an interesting space as a teacher. Um, we, I feel like in education, we always talk about like the, we're looking for the silver bullet. Like, we'll do this, it's going to fix everything in your classroom. And of course, there is nothing. It's you have 30 different kids in your class who have different personalities, different traits, different strengths, different likes, different weaknesses. Um, and so, our more traditional model of the classroom, like, you know, ask a question, raise a hand, you get certain, like, you know, five or ten kids would be answering. Uh, then sliding to the social media space, while some kids would want nothing to do with social media, there are other kids who would be, feel very comfortable in maybe not raising a hand and sharing class, but uh, tweeting something out or posting a blog post and sharing that way. And so we kind of started pulling more and more people to the fold, which was kind of a great experience. So one of our learnings over time uh, was reflecting on the idea of what made a difference. So as we scaled up this program, first year it was one semester, those seven teachers. Uh, the second year we kind of went both semesters and then schools kind of gradually branched out and scheduled as many sections of this as they chose to run and had teachers interested in taking this approach. Um, one of the, the biggest reflections we had that was kind of a aha moment after the fact was the thing that made the biggest difference from the teachers was the fact that they were isolated. And although that sounds like an odd thing, it was simply the fact that I couldn't walk across the hall and chat with Andrew about what we were doing in class tomorrow or go down to the staff room. We actually had to use the tools that the students were learning, we had to collaborate, we had to work through these different electronic mediums and use these kinds of tools in order to facilitate our work as teachers. In essence, that made a huge difference because the teachers experienced and owned the journey, the same journey that their students would uh, would be experiencing and, and that was really huge. Uh, in terms of um, things identified as challenges and next steps, eventually uh, some of our principals started to identify timetabling became a problem. Why? Well, sometimes you had more teachers wanting to do the Futures Forum style teaching than there were sections. Uh, sometimes you couldn't make the sections work in your school. I know some of the principals talked about, you know, especially if you were in a high school where you had single sections, trying to get the single sections timetabled and keep supporting something that was new. In some schools that became a problem. They had to make choices and so uh, over time we saw some dips in how many participated and then it would raise again. Um, all good, um, but tough choices uh, along the way. Uh, in terms of the, the keeping it fresh, um, 
On one side, we were really hoping that this program would attract attention and people would watch, they would have questions, they would be interacting with the teachers actually in the program. Um, but what we found was when people reached a sufficient enough level, they really started to take this idea of, so where's the binder? Just pass me everything that you're doing and I'll start doing it tomorrow uh, or next year, next semester. Um, that wasn't what we were after because that's not really teachers going into that sort of teaching space and having had those experiences. So as a result of that, in terms of the mixing it up, we actually differentiated our, our teacher streams within this program. So the front running first group, we said, keep going, keep evolving. And for people that were in the other streams, the idea was not to copy the first group, but to evolve this into something that was unique to your stream and not make it cookie cutter. Uh, so that was that was important, and I think that's that's done well. Uh, nurturing spin-offs. One of the good things about this is people started to talk about what about other grades, what about other combinations of courses, and so now schools are running all kinds of variants on this: history and, and English together. There's science and math ones. There's all kinds of different approaches that you can take. And I think in terms of nudging practice, getting people thinking about how to do something differently. That's, that part's been a success. Uh, so with that in mind, just kind of some things that kind of came out of this practice for us. So um, again, it was a cross curricular approach. So for me, with my grade 10 students, it was uh, the English civics and careers curriculum blended together across up into two periods with the same group of students. Uh, and now that we have these tools in the classroom and we're looking for ways to collaborate and uh, connect with others digitally, um, it opened up interesting opportunities. So this, this project here came out of uh, this is Alison Bullock here, the teacher in Florida. Um, she was a grade four teacher at this time. And I think like three, three and a half years ago, just as the board kind of announced, we were going to switch over to Google Apps for Education. We met at a conference in London actually. We were sitting down and chatting about how kind of geeking out how great it was that we're switching over to GAF, the opportunities that was going to open the door for. And we said we should try and connect it some way and figure out what we can do with it. And so we kind of walked away from the conference and left it for a few months. And then after it launched, we had access. We started talking about different things we could do. And we said, why don't we try to connect our classrooms? Um, so what we did for this project was uh, my grade 10 applied students actually, um, for their civics curriculum, a big piece of civics is being an active citizen, actually going out to the community and doing something to help in some way. Uh, so for her grade fours at the end of the semester for their social sciences summative, she decided they were gonna host a museum day and they were gonna build structures from the different time periods they studied that semester. Uh, and so what we did through this was uh, we set my grade 10s in small groups. We're going to mentor her kids in grade 4 through small groups as well. So we started looking at different ways to do that. So uh, my guys built websites for the grade 4s to kind of those personalized to them to guide them through their projects. We did research, for example, one group was building a pyramid in grade 4 and a structure. So my guys built a website, they did their own research into that, uh, gave some suggestions and links for my kids to go off and research themselves. Uh, and then we started connecting different ways. So uh, they had a shared Google Doc back and forth, where we giving feedback and sharing ideas back and forth and bouncing ideas off each other. And then it evolved into a Google Hangout. So we're actually having a live video chat between the two groups, uh, where my grade, the grade fours are showing kind of what's going on in their class, and my grade tens are giving some feedback and talking through that process. So if that was an interesting way for us to kind of leverage the technology and kind of break down our classroom walls. Uh, and the key piece that came out of that um, was one, having an authentic audience uh, for your students and having a a product in class or something you're doing in class that had value past just your classroom and uh, walls and the teacher in your class. Uh, I was very used to students like, you know, hand something back and ends up in recycling them way out. Or you return to them digitally and then that's kind of the end of it. Uh, whereas here they can see it was going to have real life value. And so the engagement level in my class bumped up big time for uh, if we were taught grade 10 applied. They are not the easiest group to always get uh, to be engaged with what's going on in class and they completely zoned on this and took to it. Because they knew if they screwed up, they were just hurting themselves, they were going to hurt these great fours a little bit too. And, uh, they really owned that process too. Um, so just going to give you an example of kind of what that looked like. Um, actually, what they would think was sound here. Good there? Hi. Uh, so 
this is a uh, just a screen grab from the Hangouts. So you can see my grade 10 apply guys down here sitting down in my classroom on a Chromebook. Uh, these guys are on an iPad. Uh, and now it's grade 4 class and it's going to kind of take us through what they've been doing kind of connect and hear the feedback from my grade 10 students as well a little bit.
for a staff as well, we can kind of go back and look like what is the feedback you got last year? How, what were you struggling with before? Are you showing improvements as you kind of evolve through the, the grades here in your school? Or are you having consistent problems, same problems over and over and over again? Um, so that's going to really kind of transform the space for us as well. I will pass over to Mark here. Um, not like love breaking down the numbers and talk, talking about marks, but it is important. We saw some significant gains kind of on this project, so I'll pass this over to Mark here too. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, so one of the things that we had done um, was to gather some research in two different ways. We have a small uh, sort of board um, hosted research um, team on our on staff. And we also partnered with uh, Pearson Ed to do some independent research as well. Um, and throughout this process over the four years, we actually um, not only monitored formal assessments, but we had uh, surveys that were done with the students, the parents, the teachers. Uh, I think there was over a hundred focus groups discussions that were done with the students. And uh, Pearson uh, did a really good job helping us analyze all of that um, information. It was just done for an internal uh, board document. It never was uh, published publicly. But through this whole process, uh, what we found was significant gains in student achievement. Students that were taught in this manner were scoring two to five percent higher than students that weren't. And these were not special class clusters. These were just students by the nature of timetabling that ended up in those sections. Um, so there was no taps or anything like that. And interestingly enough, um, we got con consistent results over the four years using different class cohorts, different teachers, different schools. This result was uh, something that was um, pretty consistent. Now, we were really encouraged, and then of course our question was, well, what are the natural building blocks that come out of this that lead to next steps? Just because this one's well or uh, No, just results. to say again, uh, mon monitoring over overall outcomes, we, we did see a significant change. Sorry, can you write this down? Yeah, absolutely. About the, about the data, could you go back one? Um, what was their like their scores before, it's just you said, so a lot more in the lower 70s, I guess? It was about, well, as I said, two to five percent was the typical range difference that we saw as sort of a, a core range. I mean, there were some mm -hmm. outlier. Uh, and so numbers. it was a combination of those different aspects, including like development, professional development, the one to one, like all those. It was the whole package. The whole package. Yeah, it's pretty much looking at their grade nine score and then comparing it to their grade 10 score against other students. They had like a, a sample size two of people not in the FFP program mm -hmm. and looking at what their evolution was between the two years versus the people that were. And, and it was, was in one school? I missed that. Sorry, thing. no. Um, it evolved over time. It's been went on for, it's been going on for about six years now. The first year it was seven teachers, seven different schools. Uh, the second year I think we were in about 12. Uh -huh. uh, I think we got as high as 13 one year and it's kind of wavered back and forth due to some very various factors. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. So in terms of the journey then, the scaling up, what comes next, um, based on this, uh, one of our sort of technology infused learning building blocks was then pushing towards one-to-one. -one. And where, where did that make sense um, to, to maybe consider doing a, another step? So in consultation with the schools and our technology steering committee, uh, we, we went forward with uh, a model that involved uh, Three, three of our 16 secondary schools, the schools that were selected for the three in the pilot project actually um, submitted proposals to be involved. It wasn't just a straw vote or anything like that. Um, so they actually wrote up some rationale, things that, that were commitments to doing the program, and especially in the areas of providing us some ongoing feedback. Um, that, was, that was important. Um, we also wanted to look at, of course, some of the behind the scenes work. What are the on the ground logistics to rolling out, um, you know, Chromebooks in, in this instance to three schools? What kind of preparation had to happen for um, uh, transitioning staff? What kind of communications was needed at the school level, school to parents, all of those kinds of things. And as I said before, from each of these steps, it's been important for our IT department to keep refining how we service the equipment, uptime on the Wi-Fi, what kind of bandwidth, connectivity, all that. And of course, you want to be uh, running at a in top-notch level. Um, maybe we can flip to the next, the next slide. Um, 
Uh, sure, so I'll kind of touch on just kind of that space too. Uh, and we started off like the first half of this presentation really talking about how we got to one-to-one -one and why we got there. Uh, but it was a really interesting evolution. Uh, it was an interesting partnership between uh, senior admin at the board level, our IT department, uh, administrators in schools, and the teachers who were playing around with the space. And how we've all, like I said, tried the Lenovo netbooks at the start. Uh, we had iPads, we started bringing Chromebooks in, talking like what's the best device, what serves, what purpose is the best. And, across the board, the teachers like said, you know, the Chromebooks have been by far the best tool for us. Um, and so what it led to this idea of last year in September 2015 of uh, choosing five versus 16 high school, say every grade nine student now is going to be handed a device. Uh, and it's, it's yours. You keep it, you take it home with you every day. They kept it with them over the summer this past year. Um, and kind of that came with that too. Like one of the things I love, like I had essentially a one-on-one -one class in the past three years, but I had students from an equity standpoint who didn't have internet access at home uh, or uh, didn't have a device at home they could access. It was good in the classroom, but as soon as they left, uh, my class, that was an issue for them the rest of the day and when they went home. Uh, and so that was really transformed last year was having, here's your device the first day of school. It is yours. Um, also looking at the one-on-one -on -one process of not having different devices. Like there's a lot of, to be said for BYOD, uh, but if you have some kids on a MacBook, some kids on a PC, some kids on a Chromebook, uh, so looking at software and things, having that kind of taken care of this way was really interesting too. Um, and so one of the really interesting things kind of on the implementation team, for, I was one of the three high schools last year who looked at uh, including this. And we were so focused on students, and rightfully so. Like I was like, this is fantastic. Like we have 300 plus kids, we're giving given a device that's theirs to keep from the school board. I know every single kid's gonna have one. Our teachers' expectations is all day, they're gonna have a device in the class that they can use. We've got great reliable Wi-Fi. Um, and so it changed a lot for our students, but the fascinating thing that I didn't really think about, I, you know, I wish I had in hindsight, but it was really impressive, was how it changed our teacher practice in our school. Um, we had in pockets people doing some real cool stuff, but the expectation, and we had some high stress from our teachers too, what did this mean uh, for people who weren't really comfortable in the space, that, okay, all of a sudden the school board's giving all these kids Chromebooks, they're gonna carry around, bring 30 kids in my classroom and show up with a device now, what does that mean? Am I still gonna give paper handouts? I'm just gonna have them copy a note off the overhead still? Um, what does that look like? And um, it was a little stressful for summer teachers at the start, but we really focused on culture and kind of saying, let's just jump in, let's try, let's play. And not a, the other thing I think the board did really well is there wasn't a huge mandate from top down saying, thou shalt do this, this, and this. We're gonna let our teachers kind of play and figure things out. Yeah, just to clarify, so you've got, you've still got that timetable block at the beginning of the day, and those kids are also carrying them to their other courses. So, so where we're at now is the kind of, that was kind of where we started off with Futures Forum. What we're talking about now is last year, uh, three of our 16 high schools, every grade <coughs> nine student at school was given a device that they carry around with them and goes home with them. So it wasn't just tied to this program anymore. It's all of our students in our high schools. And this year, September 2016, across our 16 high schools, every grade nine student was given a device. So, and the 10s and the 11s and the 12s and so are, are in the program as well, so I'm just... So right now it's those three high schools last year, the 9s and 10s have them. Okay. The other 13 schools, just the 9s, but the way Mark has set this up is that it's a sustainable budget that three years from now, every single kid in high school in the Wild region will have a board issued Chromebook that they'll be able to carry around with and keep with them. Okay. This is another bit of a tangent, but what do you guys do about repairs? Do you just replace or do you... No, no, it's, that's, that's a great question. Great question. Um, yeah, do you want to start with that, Mark? Or I sure. Do. Well, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to do the pilot project. As I said, from an IT perspective, yeah. we're looking at support models. So, um, one of the things, and I, 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 I didn't talk about it uh, in the earlier slide, but I think in terms of the rollout and so on, one of the things we recognized up front was not to expect every school to do a cookie cutter thing. So, for example, um, in our pilot program, two of the schools handed out the Chromebooks on the first day, but one did it through more of a uh, sort of a central location. Kids came down, they met their vice principal, handed in their paperwork, picked up their device. Um, we set it up so that they took the device home in a box. Um, each student was responsible to recycle the cardboard at home. They charge it at home. The batteries last six hours, so there was no fuss, no muss at the school end. Yeah. Um, they handled those individual things well. Um, one of the other schools, they actually, uh, we shipped them to the schools with labels on them that identified the student, the homeroom. So one school repackaged the big shipment into homeroom bunches and the kids picked them up through a homeroom process. Our third school, uh, which you'll see a video clip from the uh, principal, now superintendent, uh, in another slide here, they actually held off and they did a whole series of staff development, lunch and learn kinds of things 
um, extending their school culture, if you would, and they actually distributed the devices uh, around Thanksgiving. And so they had about a five week lead time into the school year just to make sure of their own level of readiness. So we recognized, well, I think there's always this, well, here's how we're going to do it. We recognize the importance of differentiation and to come back to your repair cost and then mm -hmm. that's something we wanted to learn about. So initially we started out with, if you have a problem with a device, ship it into the Ed Center and we'll either fix it or swap it uh, kind of thing. But we found that was too slow for the students just because 116 uh, secondary schools, you're reliant then on your courier service. Uh, so we actually set up a small loaner stock for each school. So now a uh, student can go down and see their in-school technician or their, uh, their <laughs> library team, depending on how they're managing that the school. Um, they simply do a swap, so the student stays operational and we'll fix the other one uh, behind. In terms of how this plays out, uh, surprisingly, um, the, the repair level is about the same as you would expect from a laptop or, or desktop scenario. It's about the same rate. Mm -hmm. um, we've had very few drops. Um, I think one stepped on, uh, one got cracked in a knapsack, but it's pretty low. I would say it's probably around a 3% uh, repair rate, which is not outside of technology margins too, too much, I don't think. so. Um, how, was the, how was the cost associated with repair? Was it like reasonable? I guess that was more of my question. Oh, it makes okay. sense to repair them versus replace them as they started to break. We, we did buy a warranty program with them. We ended up choosing uh, for our, our large rollout this year, we settled on a Dell product because um, yeah. we were really concerned about the quality of the case, being able to take some bumps and bangs and yeah. uh, performance and so on. So we actually did road test uh, models from a variety of vendors and, and we landed with the, the Dell program uh, at this point. So we have that with a warranty program. Um, in terms of repair costs, we actually do have an IT repair budget and everything's kind of being managed through that since the percentages seem about right. Um, on the school end though, um, different philosophies interest and we're actually collaborating through a Google Doc on what that process will look like. Yeah. So, in preparation for this year, of course, everybody wanted some flexibility. Well, we should really treat it like any other device. Like, what happens if a student damages a saxophone and they get their, their football helmet cracked or, you know, their whatever science thing gets stolen or whatever? Why should we treat technology any differently than things from, from other board um, educational resources? So we tried to not make it different. So what we asked, the, where we've landed for right now, and it may change, um, but schools asked to do some upfront investigation. In other words, they wanted to find out, was it stolen from carelessness? Um, was it stolen for other reasons? Were you, you know, did you lose it? How was it damaged? You know, was it truly accidental or was it in a fit of anger or something like that? And so depending on how that played out, we've said, you know, schools can play a role in what percentage of a repair a student might be responsible for. So that was the philosophy coming into this year. As real life plays out, I think people are wanting a bit more of a clear rule book, if you would. Yeah. Just do this. Um, but that's not what the voices were last year. So we're kind of treating this process as a little bit of a living document. Um, you know, at the back end from an IT perspective, as long as we're not going in the hole and that the repair rates are I would say within reason, um, you know, I think we can kind of go along the way we are. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I'm also curious, is there studies done on the uh, longevity of Chromebooks? It's, it's an interesting space actually, because uh, they're a relatively new products. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, and so the evolution too, so like uh, these guys here, we our early purchases were the silver Samsungs that were pretty popular in education. Um, I had a classroom card that were being used like every period of the day for five periods, and it's been four years of a chunk of them now, and they're still going strong for the most part. And the other thing I would say too is uh, 
the kids take ownership for having this is yours, you get to keep this, this is good, you should have this for the next four years of high school. They take really good care of them. We had a lot of concerns about how this was gonna go from the start, like, hey, this is new, what's this gonna be like, how the kids gonna handle it. Uh, they take way better care of them and handle them much better than they do in a traditional like that car coming around, because it's not there. It's like, you know, you see if you shove it hard, there's not a whole lot of concern for it. Uh, but it's safe for like these guys here, which are not nearly as sturdy as the Dell ones we purchased. Uh, a lot of mine, which are going in and out of the cart every single period, um, are still going strong four years in. I think that's the hope for the most part is if here's an is in grade nine, this will hopefully make it to the end of grade 12 for you. Um, and maybe having a life of a year or two past that potentially. Well, there's the planned obsolescence with, yep. the, with yep. the licensing for Chromebooks as well through the admin console, so you got to watch that too. But so it's, yeah, it's fair. I, I, I think it's I think it's five years for a, for a, for the Chromebook license on, on the admin console. I can't I can't remember. There's a license on Yeah, it's a thirty five dollar license for Chromebook if you want to administrate it through the uh, through the console. So you can't extend it beyond the five years. Well, I think uh, I came up yesterday. It was um, at some point it will Google no longer guarantees it will receive updates. And this is sort of just like that starting arrow, to happen. That arrow button, like that. Not being a guy with Chromebooks, I learned all this yesterday. I, I think it's worth investigating uh, Chromebook licensing and. Yeah. So I what you've described is, is is very accurate. So like when we roll out our Chromebooks, we buy a license per Chromebook, and I think realistically Google has said roughly this five-year period is what we can guarantee that our versions of Chrome will, will work on. And so, you know, from our standpoint, you know, even if a student takes, you know, uh, an extra semester or two for, for some valid reasons in our program, that they should make it through a, up to, a, say, a maximum of five years in high school with the one license. And I think that's fair on the Google end. I mean, to promise that, you know, some version of Chrome in uh, 2020 is going to work on a 2013 Chromebook. I mean, that's a bit risky on their part. So, I think a five-year window is very fair in today's world, given the rapid change and the price of products. Exactly. Now, I mean, on the ground, um, we've had, as I said, really good luck with uh, the devices and the batteries and all of that stuff. So the license is intact. So. Unless one gets really overused, damaged, whatever, we're actually anticipating that kind of a four to five year window on the device would be quite appropriate for students. Now, how that plays out in the future, I guess, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll tell. But we've also been an early adopter iPad board as well. And, you know, those devices, like the iPad 2s that we bought, you know, five, six years ago are still going. They still hold the charge. Mm -hmm and that they're very serviceable in terms of supporting student learning. So I know initially there's lots of worry in that space yeah. about the batteries and so on, but our, our experience has been that technology's been pretty rock solid overall. I think as you head more to the cloud to the, the processing power, I mean, Chromebooks aren't having a processing power, but as things go more and more to the cloud, it's more about the bandwidth of your Wi-Fi mm -hmm. than it is about the device itself, mm -hmm. um, especially for most stuff in your classrooms. I, I'm personally not that worried about that space more. When it was buying like, like an iPad 2, I would say like those, even like Apple support talking about the plan obsolescence too, like they might not support them after three years sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chromebook is really just a gateway to the web, and so long as you have that access to Wi Fi, it's good. You should be pretty safe from a future proofing standpoint. And then, so I have one more question. No, please. Sorry. Um, um, was there a reasoning into why not publishing? like? kind of the study and the work that you've done. We, um, and especially, I, I'm interested because I was looking at the numbers again and it didn't include math. And there is such an important focus on math. Why was math left out of that equation? Well, these are just two slides out of it. Right, exactly. And I'm sure you have it, right? And, and why not publish it? Because I think it's really valuable information that would be able to like, be replicated in other places. We were using that as what, what's our next steps? Um, and when we started the Futures Forum project, all the bonanza that you see now about math wasn't even on the radar then. It was all about literacies. And so this project was much more tagged into the idea of, of, of literacies and transforming practice and assessment practices in that space. Um, so, you know, um, and we were looking at overall results, not just subject-based, like how does this impact learning, engagement, which I think is valuable data for 
especially people but, in the systems? Yeah, level? absolutely. But I mean, now that we've got this program launched, you can see kids using Chromebooks in their math and science courses in all kinds of different capacities. And, you know, I'm sure we would find similar results there mm -hmm. on the assumption that those teachers are also changing their practice and not just inserting Chromebooks into some old way of lockstep teaching. So, yeah. as I was saying earlier, like, I think the, the most interesting thing about going one to one working with schools, my school specifically, was I was focused on how great this is for the students, but the transformation we've seen in our school and teaching practice has been phenomenal. I mean, like, more than like the past eight, nine years of PD we've run in our school just by saying, your kids are going to have one to one in your classroom now. You should think about how that's going to change your classroom and your practice. And we've seen phenomenal transformation uh, in what our staff is doing without even having direction from above. It's just they've taken it on because, oh, I can rethink my classroom now. Like, it really does transform what you can do in your classroom. And we've seen our staff jump into that and really adopt that. Because there's uh, some pressure, some expectation there from the students like, I've got this device, we should probably be using it. And what does that look like? The other thing that I comment from an IT perspective is a huge benefit to using the Chromebooks is the IT maintenance concept is reduced to almost zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Chromebooks update themselves in the background, uh, as you alluded to, Andrew. The you know you can push and control the devices through your Google Apps setup, and so what would have been an army of people that managed you know image design, testing, pushing all that stuff out on the machines. Like a giant fleet of Chromebooks can be managed by, you know, maybe two people that can back each other up mm -hmm. through this console approach. So you see, you know, a shift in what IT staff would would actually do. For me, I see that as as a positive because there's other pressure points. We need less people on sort of what you would term as desktop repair, and we need more people doing web and more people monitoring our network and supporting it and so on. Yeah. And so it gives you a way to repurpose staffing dollars um, in positive ways that keep it aligned with uh, good support for classroom <coughs> requirements. Mm -hmm. I've kind of covered down talking space anyways. Yeah. Right here. Uh, it's kind of like talked about this already, but uh, like I love showing the slides because um, we made a shift in like talking from so these devices are how we're supporting our staff to look at this space. Um, and we've got to more on a conference model and giving these teachers a lot, like empowering them, saying, what do you want to work on? What do you want to focus on? Um, instead of having that very top-down approach of saying, everyone should be doing this, or having an administrator, one teacher stand in the front of 80 staff members, be like, this is what we're all going to talk about. Uh, we would leverage people in the school and talk about, like, you know, eight to ten people, what are you happy to speak to? Uh, what space would you get in? Talk about that. And even our admin supporting yourself on staff days too, being like, if none of these sessions work for you and you have another teacher who knows doing something cool in their class and wants to take two hours to sit down and talk with them, you should do that. If there's something you want to spend some time and research on, go work on that. And so our staff felt very empowered in the space as well. And again, like the learning I've seen from them and the, the changes of practice I've seen from our staff has been absolutely phenomenal in that space. So, sorry, just a quick yeah. question. So then did you also uh, provide Provide the teachers with the same Chromebooks as the kids are in? Yeah, that's a great question too, and that's something uh, even in part of the presentation kind of pushed for. Is like, and yes, so you to answer your question, yes, every teacher who is in a one to one classroom also has a Chromebook from the board as well. I think that's hugely important because yeah. um, again, if you're going to expect the teachers to know what's going on with their students, they should have some familiarity with that device too. Uh, so, yes, all of our teachers are given a Chromebook. Uh, not across the board right now, but um, if you have one section, so if I'm teaching grade 9, 11, 12, um, I have a section of grade 9 English, the kids have one to one, therefore I was issued a Chromebook as well. So I'd say between at my school now, between 9 and 10, I'd say about 80% of our staff has probably been supplied a Chromebook, and that would say. And next year, I would think everybody will have one. Yeah, and just to add to Andrew's comments, um, we were actually able to tie getting a device uh, into the staff members' hands actually to a change that happened in moving from attendance scanning to attendance on the web. And so right away we had a commitment from the board to at least have a device per classroom, which out of the gate uh, covers most staff. And so, you know, a little bit of uh, dollar flexibility will get to one-to-one -one staff fairly easily without having to push that envelope too hard. Interesting games too and how it's evolved. Like, I'd say Google Classroom, we probably have 
I don't know if she was any teachers at her school who aren't using Google Classroom now. Um, and from the student standpoint, that's been phenomenal because they can log into one dashboard, see their four classes, uh, they see due dates and like things like that for one session. So they're like, um, our grade nine is like every single teacher was using the classroom without any direction from above. Just they chose to jump into that space and use it. Um, and it was great for staff and for students to kind of be in that space and have that one platform that was kind of working well organized everything for them as well too. Uh, what time do you want to just leave them give them a question on their own? Or? Yeah, maybe we can just flick through the slides because um, sure. I want to make sure we have time for the conversation. But we've included a number of videos here where you can actually take time on your own to watch them. But their teachers talking about how their, how their practice has changed in their classroom, the impact that it's had on student learning, um, not in, in the specific research way that we um, embrace through Futures Forum. But I think it's really powerful that Teachers are talking about, I used to do this, now I do that. Here's the benefit I see to student learning and achievement. And so um, this particular example is a good one to watch out of the mix of the videos. The next slide, I think, is... So I'll give a quick summary so people show what they're looking for. We were interested. So this is our English head talking to the student here. And, uh, the, the, how did the kind of takeaway from this was uh, staff and students really worked together, kind of became co learners in this process. And then we kind of pushed the staff too, it was like, your students are in comfortable some spaces, it's great to work with them and learn from them as they're going to learn from you. Uh, and so they were reading a book, Three for Treason, and uh, our English head here found a PDF of the story online. So she pushed that to her kids, they wanted to read her Chromebooks, and she just found one student in her headphones, she's like, What are you doing? Uh, and she was using uh, read write to have it read back to her so she would listen to the story. Uh, and that led to this really interesting conversation where it kind of spread through the school uh, very quick. And that was fascinating too, just teachers, staff, and students all learning from each other. Like someone would find something, they could, how they leverage a Chromebook for learning, and you'd find like a few students using it one week, and then three weeks from now, you find 200 students using it to kind of help their learning process. So that was fascinating as well, just that dynamic kind of back and forth, highlight this video here. Um, Mark, do you want to speak to Ron's here? Sure. Um, Ron DeBoer was the principal of one of our one-to-one -one pilot schools, and he's now, as of uh, this September, moved into a superintendent role. But in this video, he talks a lot about the importance of um, getting your staff ready, but uh, again, in the way that Andrew's described, where we respect the fact that teachers, just like students, need some differentiation in how they go about their learning. They learn in different ways, and to be respectful of that. Um, so that's definitely uh, one that I, I would recommend that you watch to get some ideas on that. Um, we did get lots of positive feedback on this um, in our community. So some nice uh, both uh, news clips on CTV and Breakfast TV Toronto and as well as some newspaper articles. So I put those links in there. Um, the details about the Futures Forum project, I've had them written up on my blog and there's also a YouTube video um, that was recorded in something else that I was involved in, so that's there. And then just a couple of conversations with Mark between the uh, principal of my high school is kind of talking about what this project looked like and the dynamics between senior and administration schools for what it looked like. Uh, another teacher at school kind of talking about how it changed her practice. Uh, Jane Gingrich, she's the uh, head of music at one of our secondary schools, and it's really interesting to hear her talk about um, how they're using Chromebooks in the arts program. Uh, some very powerful things happening. She's in a school that's uh, fairly small in terms of student numbers, um, so she has lots of differentiation that has to happen in, in that element of their arts program. So she's got some very good insights, and for those of you that are into the whole new um, assessment practices and so on, you'll hear her talk about all of that in that video. Uh, it's another arts teacher at school too who talked about how she's in the arts program and how callbacks were like, like visual arts and things like how they leverage it and that's some spaces there too. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget about building your network. We're at a point now where um, we actually um, are supporting a 10 gigabit network. Our internet traffic's at 5 gigs all day long and it really has to be coming along. So those are some stats I took in my office last week just on our internal and internet-based uh, uh, statistics. And what you really want to have happen is it's not so much about the numbers, but in a classroom perspective, can you just connect, get on, have good response time, do the devices respond well? Um, and really, from, from our perspective, we just want a teacher to be able to use Skype, use Google Hangouts to whatever they need to do to make their classroom a connected global um, space, collaborative space, inquiry space. We just want that to be transparent. It should be like hydro, it should just be there and work. So that's our goal. 
and as Andrew's pointed out, relative to five years ago, we've learned a lot about uh, you know coverage throughput, um, you know where where the narrow blocks are and getting the network nice and robust. I think it's over. I feel so fortunate to be in diversity because we have, like, at my high school now, we have any time we have more than 2,000 devices on, and everyone will be watching YouTube when it comes along. No problem. It's absolutely phenomenal. And uh, if you go one to one space, if you're trying to push teachers who are reluctant to jump in that space and things crash and they don't work, that te you might lose that teacher for months or a year or two. Um, it's sad it shouldn't be in that space, but it's the reality. If you're thinking about heading into that space, I think it's really important. Uh, anyways, thank you all for listening. We're happy to feel any questions you guys got. If not, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yep. Do you have a link or you are off for the presentation? Uh, it should be up on the resources off this schedule there too. Should be resources spots. Yeah. yeah. The actual slide deck is there now. Okay. And uh, we'll put the recording and the slide deck will also be on my blog. I'll probably get it posted by tomorrow. All right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for choosing this session. Appreciate it. Thank you.